You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello. And Lionel Burney. Hello. It's been a dark week for professional cycling with the death of Antoine de Moitier in Gent-Wevelgem after an incident with a race motorbike. And we'll be spending quite a bit of this episode discussing that, the implications, and hearing some reaction from Mark Cavendish. We'll also hear from one of the motorbike pilots to get his perspective what it's like to be in that situation. We'll hear from Mick Bennett, the Tour of Britain organiser, and Jim Mokovitz, the man in charge at BMC Racing, who's been quite a loud voice in the debate about safety in races. But first of all, before we get into all that, let's hear our weekly roundup from Lionel Burney. Yeah, so a lot of racing has been going on um, at the Tour of Catalonia. Nairo Quintana won his first race back in Europe this year. A real stellar top ten there with Alberto Contador, Dan Martin, Richie Port, TJ Van Garder and Roman Bardet, Chris Froome all in the top ten, which makes Hugh Carthy's ninth place overall even more impressive. 21-year-old British rider with the Cayo Rural team. There were stage wins there for Nasser Buhani, who got a couple, Dan Martin and Wout Poles of Sky also won. A lot of the focus was on the races in Belgium of course Greg Van Avermaet tried to pull off a late move to win the Dwarves Door Vlaanderen but uh, he was caught and then Jens de Boucher uh, won the sprint when Brian Cockard lifted his hands off the handlebars just a little bit too soon to celebrate at the E3 Harold Becker Michal Kwiatkowski and Peter Sagan got away together and it was the Polish rider who pipped Sagan at the finish but probably the biggest talking point from uh, that race was Fabian Cancellara who had a problem with his chain waited for what seemed like an eternity for his bike a very impressive move to catch up and finish fourth uh, eventually Gent Wevelgem on Sunday of course the tragic death of the Belgian rider Antoine de Moitier overshadowed everything that happened there Peter Sagan won the four man sprint at the end of the race in the women's race Chantelle Black uh, made it four wins out of four in the world tour for Bowles Dolman and in the Criterium International in Corsica Thibaut Pino won overall but there was another very unfortunate incident there with a 22 year old Belgian rider Dan Mingir who suffered a heart attack on the first stage and we learned early this week that he had passed away so, as I say, a very dark week. The incident we'll talk about most, though, is the death of Antoine de Moitier. His death seemed to be caused by a collision with a, a motorbike in the race. We don't know the full details yet, but from the sort of initial reports, it seems that he was involved in a crash and then struck by the motorbike. I think everybody around it was very aware early on that it was a serious incident, that he was badly hurt. You know, but a lot of the instant reactions weren't perhaps correct. The the pilot of the motorbike we're led to believe was a very experienced one. So, you know, some of the, the, the assumptions made perhaps perhaps incorrect. We'll, we'll find out more in the fullness of time. But we'll we'll hear, as I said earlier, a bit of reaction from Mark Cavendish and I mean other people who have different points of view on this and different roles and responsibilities. Daniel, I think you heard, didn't you, from Mark Cavendish not long after the incident. Yeah, I did. Uh, Richard Mark um, phoned me up spontaneously, really, just to express both his sorrow and, you know, some of the anger I think a lot of riders in the peloton are feeling at the moment. They're obviously putting their lives at risk every time they go out on their bikes. They know that, um, but most of those risks are self-imposed. This, however, is... Uh, well, this incident resulted from... Other circumstances, we don't know if it was someone else's error or just a, an, a, an accident, but certainly brought into sharp focus the dangers that um, are strewn everywhere on on um, or in bike races and, as I say, the risks that these guys encounter every day. So we're going to hear now from Mark, Mark speaking on Monday morning when he called me up. First of all, motorbikes, they are close to the peloton. As a sprinter, like, we benefit from the draft from a motorbike when we're taking a break, you know, my team. But then sometimes it goes the other way and you've got five of the strongest guys in the world not able to pull back. A solo guy has been away for 200k. For me right now, 
motorbikes, regardless of safety, they influence the bike race more than any doping ever could. There's a knock-on effect that comes way back to the whole way that cycling's changing. Like, take Gembevogan, for instance. Like, it's not just Gembevogan, it's easier. Highlight Gembevogan, well, that's because it's too late now. Something's going to end in tragedy. And now it's, it's already too late for someone to die because of it, you know? And it's, it's not necessarily a motorbike's fault. Like, uh, now it's 240k, and it directly goes to small roads. Like, pretty, after not that many kilometers you know, the thing is the stress to get there to be there because it could split where it used to split on the big roads and then that was it the rest of the day now it splits on the small roads so everyone fights to be at the front so even on a big road you're going to have guys spread across the whole road if they leave a gap for a motorbike to come through that's it some other rider's going to take that that spot even on the big roads it's spread across now but you've got this stress of fighting straight away to small roads like after 240k, it's going to put everyone on the hands and knees. It puts not just cycling, not just the riders. Like the riders are going to be tired from this. But puts drivers, motorbike riders. Even I spoke to Roger Hammond last night. He wasn't even driving the car. He was in the passenger seat directing, and he said he was shattered at the end of it from concentration. He said it was it was chaos, like. And that's the thing. Like the races are the kind of thing that are trying to make it action the whole day smaller roads like making everyone tired makes a better race it doesn't necessarily you make a shorter race if you want to do that now, it's easy for me to say it's easy to come back and someone said to me oh just want a bunch for you know i like small roads i like the climbs in belgium i don't want a massive bunch sprint at the end of a race anymore if the pelotons relax i'll just let them pass it used to be when a motorbike was coming past people would you move over to let motorbike pass. But this was like a few years ago, you know. Like I said, the whole excitement just changed. There's no, even from the rider's side, like they don't let motorbikes through. Because if you open that space to let a motorbike through, another rider is going to fill it. Like you see a video from the thing and I'm shouting in the Tour de France last year, and I'm shouting, Moto! Like that, that's a marshal. Got to get up the road to stop my car coming into the peloton. But then like the riders have to take responsibility for that for not moving but then it knocks on to the riders don't want to move because race organisers are going left and right small roads to try and split the peloton and crosswinds or narrow roads or whatever is happening you know not a set amount like later on in the race but if you know 120k that's when the race starts that's when the small roads come the motor legs are going to guarantee to be passed by 100k nothing's really happening there so then they have to stop and whereas if it's from the word go you have to stop and go like the whole time you know you don't know when to pass this to take an opportunity to try and pass when you can there's two immediate things you can do that actually would not just not just the motorbike thing but it would change a hell of a lot in cycling which are the people saying, oh, they ride like robots and that. If you want full gas action racing, there's two things you do. One, put on a circuit, where it's a closed road circuit or, or a motor circuit, you know, which as a rider is not fun. You can have fixed cameras, so it reduces the amount of motorbikes. You've got closed roads, so it reduces the amount of motorbike marshals. Technically, you don't need two cars and convoy. And two, shorten the race. Like again, I'm 30 years old, I can deal with a long distance bike race. But if you want action from the beginning, shorten the race. It's easy to reduce the amount of riders in the peloton, reduce the amount. But people are going to lose their jobs for that. And we've had the same number of riders for many, many, many years. For decades now. And there wasn't these problems. But cycling followed. It wasn't a set story because that's how you did it. It was the most efficient way of riding a race. That poor guy, he puts himself for enough risk as it is riding a bike. Now, this is through no fault of his own. It's not through him being reckless, going in the corner too hard, descending like a maniac, trying to fight for the right position. Like, it's something that's out of his control. And it's not like he's training on the road where he knows these dangers are. It's supposed to be in a sporting arena. And something that's beyond his control has done this that can be traced back to other people. Like, it's not necessarily the motorbike driver's fault, but there's just a load of certain aspects, certain things that happen, like, not on effect to cause this, you know? There's been a lot of motorbike crashes the last years, and there's been calls for changes before this happens. Nothing has been done at all. Nothing at all. I mean, what's quite interesting listening to Cavendish there, Daniel, is that 
the, there's there's anger, there's frustration, but it's not clear cut at all, is it? It's not simple. And even the writers themselves are aware, and we've seen Marcel Kittel's very eloquent blog on the subject as well, about how multifaceted this is in terms of whose, I don't want to use the word fault, but there are lots and lots of factors that go into making bike racing dangerous. And and I think, you know, he's talking about narrow roads. He's talking also, interestingly, you know, in a way that riders can, can say that perhaps other people can't say with the same authority that riders themselves also have to take some responsibility for making the racing a little bit safer. Yeah, and I think the devil is obviously in the detail. There have been a lot of conclusions drawn and broad brushstroke painting of what is a, obviously a problem with safety and will, will always be a problem in professional cycling because it is a dangerous sport but the, the the difficulty is really nailing down the specifics of what needs to be done and you know I think we're going to hear over the course of this episode when we hear from other people there is a huge divergence of opinion over what exactly is the problem and you know Mark mentioned there issues that I haven't really heard anyone else mention in the aftermath of this terrible accident at the weekend that you know race courses have changed and they the organizers are trying to take races onto smaller roads more interesting routes and scatter obstacles um, hills narrow roads places where there might be crosswinds throughout race routes again for the benefit of TV viewers predominantly but you know Mark is making the point there that it might be making life more dangerous for everyone on the road. So it it is, it's very very complicated. I think isn't we're it? also all aware of the uh, uh, contradiction inherent in, in this discussion debate because <clears throat> you know a lot of the motorbikes, not all of them, but a lot of them are carrying cameras of some description, whether actual cameras, TV cameras, and so on. And the point has been made that those pilots tend to be the most skillful. Though I remember an incident a few years ago at the Tour de France with the Getty photographer um, who got, you know, was passing through the bunch, got caught up with one of the CSC riders, was it, um, it, it, was, it was Chris Anker Sorensen, I Nikki think. Nicky Sorensen. Nicky Sorensen, par- apologies. And actually uh, managed to dislodge him from his bike and, and, and drive along with the bike attached to the motorbike for a bit. It was a horrific looking incident. The um, pilot and the motorbike was, was expelled from the race for... I think the rest of the tour, and this was in the opening few days. Now, I, I spoke to the, the photographer who was very shaken by it, and he said that that particular pilot, you know, had 25, 30 years' experience of piloting in, in, in bike races. And these things, these things can happen. I mean, I've also been on a motorbike in the Tour de France and uh, ridden through the bunch on the back of a motorbike, and the the bunch can switch from one side of the road to the other in the blink of an eye and there's very little a motorbike pilot can do in, in a situation like that and like I said earlier we don't know the full details of what happened with the, the awful incident with Demoitier and we shouldn't jump to too many conclusions about you know certainly whose fault it was but it's a very very difficult thing to do to, to ride a motorbike in a bike race No you're right Rich and Mark also makes the point that a lot of the motorbikes well a large proportion of the motorbikes are there to guarantee riders safety and we're going to hear a bit more about this from Mick Bennett the Tour of Britain organiser later but you know a lot of well the motorbike's job consists of blocking driveways blocking junctions blocking entries onto the course particularly in countries like Belgium Holland where there are an awful lot of roads and there are an awful there's an awful lot of scope there for vehicles which shouldn't be on the course to get onto the course and for a lot of the guys on the motorbikes that is their job so they're doing it in front of the peloton, waiting for the peloton to pass, getting ahead of the peloton and doing it again and blocking another junction. So they are there to guarantee riders' safety. And, you know, we've we've probably seen less of that, the, those problems of, of cars getting onto the course, etc., and causing hazards in recent years. And things probably have improved. And, you know, the Tour of Britain's a good example. Again, we'll hear from Mick Bennett later. But, you know, there was a problem on that race, particularly with cars getting onto the course and causing hazards. You know, I mean, I think uh, you think back to Marco Pantani in 1995, a very famous incident where he, well, he almost lost a leg, he almost ended his career when a car got onto the end of the course at the end of um, Milan Turin. And we don't hear about that too often these days. That's a very good point. How many many awful incidents are avoided 
thanks to the motorbike marshals. Well, and, and it's not just the motorbike marshals and it's not just the race organisers or the UCI. I think some credit, I know it's very difficult when everyone's upset and everyone's angry and everyone wants action to be taken, but I think some credit does have to be given to the likes of the UCI and race organisers. I mean, just last week, uh, Milan, San Remo, no one will have noticed this or not many people will have noticed it. No one has talked about it. But, you know, the descent of the Poggio is very dangerous. Every year, pretty much, someone c comes off on the same hairpin bend. And we've seen bad accidents. We've seen bad injuries there. You know, Anthony Rue overshoots a bend for the FDJ rider and he crashes into a mattress, which someone um, has thoughtfully put there. And it saves him. And again, you know, no one mentions this in, in the aftermath of the race, but Anthony Rue then rides in 40 seconds down or a minute down on the winner and, you know, it's disaster averted. So, you know, I think we all in our jobs every now and again need a wake up call and we need to be reminded of our responsibilities. And for us as journalists, that comes in the form of, you know, someone calling us up to say, you've misquoted me or you've got this wrong, etc. And it's tragic that it takes someone dying and it shouldn't take someone dying to remind the UCI or race organisers of their responsibilities but the, one of the legacies or the main legacy of Antoine de Moitier will be that he will save lives um, and, and this accident will actually save lives and it will make professional cycling safer for the next 10 or 15 years and I know that's of no comfort to his family I think the interesting thing from what Mark Cavendish talked about was um the way that races are organised and one way to make races safer is to organise them on a circuit where the entire course can be barriered off or, you know, locked down for the duration of the race. It's worth remembering that even a World Tour event like in Wevergen will be operating with a rolling road closure where the motorbikes are constantly overtaking the bunch and the brake in order to get ahead to another spot to close off another bit of road and as you're saying Daniel you know if you drive around Belgium Holland well, anywhere really there are, there are so many hundreds and hundreds of places where cars could come out onto the course um, and, and cause an incident so those motorbikes are performing a, a key function and I think in the immediate aftermath as you say when emotions are running high there's a temptation to, to latch on to small s snippets of evidence and extrapolate a big picture from those. And I'm talking about um, the the pictures, the screen grabs of um, uh, Vyacheslav Kuznetsov, the Katusha rider, who was surrounded by six or seven or eight motorbikes while he was on the attack on Sunday. And that's evidence, you know, what are all these bikes doing here? Why are there so many vehicles? And then the three days of Dapana, images of cars coming very close past riders again used as evidence that everything's out of control and and these incidents in isolation do happen but it's not necessarily you know the, a near miss or a near miss is not an accident as we'll we'll hear from a motorcycle rider a little bit later on but um it, the unhelpful thing in the immediate aftermath is is seeing small bits of information such as uh, the Belgian newspaper that printed the number of vehicles that are in a race 24 security motorbikes X number of press motorbikes X number of camera motorbikes and then the, the debate and argument about whether any of these vehicles have a function in the race and I think they do have a function in the race I think there's obviously a, a, a drive and a desire for change to ensure that safety is the, the paramount um, priority but I don't think the UCI has necessarily just been sitting on their hands. I think they have been doing work behind the scenes, but they're not necessarily in a position at the moment where they've got far enough into their investigations um, to to bring about some changes. Uh, certainly this incident will speed that up, and I think Brian Cookson's um, piece that he wrote on the UCI's website makes clear that they will look at they they are looking at all aspects of safety in um, bike racing because there have been an increase in the number of incidents over recent years. But those motorbikes and vehicles, you know, they're not in there willy-nilly. They well, are in there performing a role in the bike race. And I think it's down to the governing body to, to just look at every single vehicle and work out what they're doing and, and decide, you know, whether there needs to be limits on the number of vehicles taking into account different road conditions in different countries. It's, I mean, that image, you know, is, is very arresting, but... The, you know, it's a bit like the incident with Arnold Demar at Milan San Remo, where, uh, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the controversy around his victory and the allegations that he'd held on to a team car, there was a picture posted of a Francis de Jure rider holding on to a team car, but it wasn't Arnold Demar and it wasn't on 
the same climb um, that it's that danger of taking a snapshot from a race and extrapolating from it yeah and if we go back to last week's podcast I mean we spent 40 minutes probably debating whether Demar might have or might not have taken a toe and we didn't mention the fact that commissaires perhaps should have seen it or had there been more commissaires they would have seen it and of course you know most of the time well, a large number of the commissaires are on motorbikes so if we want better observance of the rules then we, we need just as many if not more motorbikes but just a final point on this um, you know Lionel you talked about what the UCI will do it really is as I said before about specifics isn't it and it seems to me that rather than just sort of throw the baby out of the bathwater and say it's all rubbish and you know they're, they're completely negligent you know it seems to be a problem with overtaking and there seems to be a problem with speed of overtaking the majority of the incidents that have been highlighted have been about overtaking and you know there are also factors things that the layman and certainly we had no knowledge of prior to this incident for example in a minute we're going to hear from Graham Watson's longtime motorcycle pilot Luke Evans about the weight of motorcycles and the power of motorcycles and how that can be a factor well, yeah, let's give this whole thing a bit of context and um, roll back a little bit. This issue is one that has been um, brewing because of the number of incidents that have happened over certainly recent months. Mm. And when I was at Paris Nice earlier in the spring, I saw Jim Okovich, the BMC manager, who'd written an open letter to the UCI after a couple of incidents at the end of February, one at Kerner, Brussels Kerner, and one at La Drome in France. And as you say, Daniel, I also spoke to Luke Evans, a motorcycle driver. So let's look at how we've got to this point. There have been a number of incidents between vehicles and riders in recent years. At the 2011 Tour de France, Juan Antonio Fletcher and Johnny Hoogeland were knocked off by a car. At the US National Time Trial Championships in 2014, it was alleged that a motorcycle was too close to Taylor Finney when he crashed at high speed. Last year, Jesse Sargent was knocked off by a car in the Tour of Flanders. A motorcycle hit Greg Van Avermaet at the San Sebastian Classic. At the Vuelta a España, Peter Sagan was hit by a motorbike. And then earlier this season, Stig Brooks of Lotto Sudal was knocked off by a motorcycle at Kerner, Brussels Kerner. That same weekend, BMC's Danilo Wiss fell off after a TV motorbike got too close to the bunch going round a tight bend at La Drome, a stage race in southern France. Those incidents at the end of February prompted BMC's general manager, Jim Okovic, to write an open letter to the UCI on the subject of vehicle safety in races. In that letter he wrote, We all understand that there exists an element of danger in the sport of cycling from a number of places and conditions, but no rider expects to be run down from behind by an over-enthusiastic pilot on a closed race course. Disgraceful. This has got to stop before the headlines in the future are of a more disturbing nature than what we have seen in 2015 and now again in 2016. Read now following the death of Antoine de Moitier during Sunday's gent Wevelgem race, those words are tragically prophetic. A week after Okovic wrote his open letter, I spoke to him at Paris-Nice. It's been an ongoing problem for, for a, a, more than a year now, since really the Finney incident took place uh, almost two years ago now. So it's been a series of accidents involving vehicles, whether they're motorbikes or their cars, to a number of different riders from many other teams. So it's a, it's a and, and not at any one organizer is, is, is at fault. Uh, it's, it seems to be widespread, and there's certain reasons, I think, that, that, that these things are happening. What, what are those reasons, Sam? Well, look, the, the roads themselves are not the same as they were 10 years ago, 5 years ago, or even last year. And local communities, this is our stadium we're standing in right now. And the local community maintains these roads in very good condition, except they do attempt to slow traffic down. So they build roundabouts and speed bumps and other things. Uh, and they put things in the road that uh, we call road furniture that um, you can't foresee in your preparation for the races. We try to do recon for the bigger races to see the courses, to catch, you know, see where the where there might be obstacles that we that would we, we might occur. But um, we can't see every inch of the road. So uh, 
there's some responsibility for that by the, the UCI commissars that are on site here and by the, lo- the ra- local organizing committee. Are you satisfied that everybody that's in the race con- convoy is operating to the same standards, or, or do you think there's a need for some uniform rules that, that go across all the UCI races? I, I have no idea what kind of licenses they have or authority they have to be able to drive. I drove in the Peloton for 20 years as a director sportif. Uh, that was my license, basically, that I had a director sportif license, and that qualified me to drive a car in the bike race. I don't know what everybody has in terms of a, 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 a qualification or a license to drive in a, in a professional bike race. I have no idea. So you think that's something that the UCI could look at in the first instance to make sure that everyone within the race is, is basically um, operating to the same rules and the same standards? It would it would be, I think, uh, a good place to start. There's other places that, that need attention, but uh, certainly understanding who's driving what for what reason, what, why are they driving in the race? What's the purpose of that vehicle being in the race? And it, it varies from race to race, depending on how big the organizer is and how much attention it has uh, for people who want to be there on site. So I don't know what, I have no idea, you know, what, what, that, what, that, what that qualification is, nor how many vehicles are permitted to be on the course. Is your sense that these things are becoming more common? Well, it's not my sense, it's reality. It's, you can see it happening. Uh, so I'm not making, it's not something that's, that's fiction or that we're, it's, somehow I've got some kind of idea that there's something going on that isn't. You're watching it, I'm watching it on television. So, uh, look, the ASO has run safe races for years, 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 and they still do today. Uh, and they have a very strict policy about car movement in the bike race. That's for sure. I remember that personally, experience, personal experience. So, uh, again, it's not one thing you can say. This is the reason, that's the reason. I think you got to start somewhere and come up with some uh, some regulations about who's driving in the race, what's their function in the race, uh, is the peloton too large? Uh, there's there's all kinds of different things you can pinpoint, and then somebody has to say, okay, let's make some changes here. You see ten red cars here. They're going to be spread out during the race today, and and they're going to be directing the traffic flow through the, from the back to the front of the peloton. The riders, motorbikes, cars, anything that's moving out there, they control. So you have to control the bikes that are moving, and motorbikes with cameras are pretty close because they're trying to get a television. So I understand that perfectly. Um, but they still have to drive with a sense of responsibility and knowing these distances can change very quickly and rapidly because when riders accelerate they accelerate they, they, and, they, and that, that movement is, is unpredictable so look you, you, it doesn't matter how difficult it is to drive you have to expect that the riders are going to do the unexpected all the time. And if you don't have enough space and enough feeling that you're not in a safe zone, you got to get out of there and wait. So it's a judgment call. Also at Paris Nice, I spoke to Luke Edwards Evans, who's been working for magazines for a long time and is currently editor of Cycle Sport. He's also an experienced motorcyclist and has driven for the photographer Graham Watson at the Tour de France Classics and Stage Races since 1990. He took a break from driving in 97, but has been a regular in the peloton since 2007. It's important to stress again that I was speaking to Luke before the tragic accident that claimed the life of Antoine de Mottier. But his insight into the role of the motorcyclists in the peloton is very enlightening. I started by asking him whether things have changed much since 1990. They've changed quite a lot. Uh, It was it it was much less of a regulated sport in terms of how we work in those days. So um, there was a bit more of a free for all actually sometimes in in bike races, uh, which um, which uh, older listeners will remember especially in things like the Flemish classics where you had sort of uh, half a dozen motorbikes crowding up all the climbs. Nowadays, you, that just doesn't happen. We are far more, we're far more regulated, literally. The, the, we have the, on a race like this, but we're at Paris-Nice, you have two regulators in their red jackets, which you can see on t- TV, and we have to obey what they tell us to do. So we have to go back in ones 
uh, to shoot the riders and then we have to shoot back up the road and stay clear of the riders. But the elements of the job are exactly the same in that you still have to ride along with 200 riders, uh, live with them day to day and um, all those elements of hazards and risks with the uh, team cars and the other riders and passing the peloton, they're all pretty much the same. So talk to me about what your kind of daily routine is. You're set out on a, on a routine day. What, what will you try to do on, in the four or four and five hours of a stage? We have a fairly set routine in that um, Graham um, has two roles, if you like. Uh, uh, his principal role is to report the race. So um, obviously we're always on the lookout for action in the race anything um, anything that's happening in the race like a, a crash a breakaway the early breakaway which it always happens these days uh, and then his second role which is as a team photographer he works for half a dozen teams so the early part of our day quite often is hanging around at the back of the bunch doing fairly pum drum photos of the riders coming back after they've had a pee stop or talking to their DS's in the cars as they come back stopping for punctures, that's always a good photo so that, that you always get your hand in early on with a few shots like that and then obviously as the race warms up um, at any point it can be go from the gun in which case you're working hard all day and then normally in the last 50k then we try to stay in front and get lucky, get the breakaways get the winning move sometimes we might stay behind stay on a stage like this on an early sprint stage we might stay behind because there could be a big crash at the end so you know we're, we're there to report the race and um, and it, sometimes that means we have to get a bit involved in the action and obviously you have to overtake the peloton or overtake the break that are there rules about how and when you can do that we have to ask the regulator if we can pass and once they say yes you can pass which quite often will be on a road which they deem to be a safe road then uh, it's up to us to get by safely uh, and as quickly as we can so we might sometimes be let allowed to go through on quite a tight road where the riders are from um, riding in the gutter on both sides and then we have to pick our way through really really carefully and you, and you might get halfway through the bunch and the radio will, will spark up into life and say uh, Watson stop you know, and then we'll, we'll, they've had enough of us trying to get through maybe the riders might have shouted this a couple of times and then we have to drift back so it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a quite a gentle sort of uh, operation really so the the misconception might be that you're choosing when you move and how you move, and actually that's not the case. You're being told and given permission to move. Most of the time, yes. When the race starts to break down and there's multiple groups on the road, then we are pretty much left to our own devices, and you are expected to behave in the, in the correct manner as you would do when you're being watched by regulators and so on. So there's quite a lot of individual responsibility involved. And... Um, the example that you were mentioning where say there's a small group and they're riding on half the road it looks like an easy pass but the key is not to go blasting through at 50 miles per hour um, it, it always, we're always looking out for a rider who might swing out having done a turn or for whatever reason and then you, and that's the case, and it happens quite often. Is then you just have to slow down and and give the rider priority. Because there was the incident in Kurna, Brussels, Kurna, where Stig Brooks of the um, Lotto Sudal team swung out of the line and was was uh, basically hit by the motorcycle coming past. Ironically, the motorcycle was carrying one of the race medics. So what you're saying is the rider has every right to swing out of the line how and when he wishes to do so, and the motorcycle has to basically take into account any unpredictable movements that might riders might make yes he does absolutely yes uh, and and obviously sometimes uh, you know sometimes it's a close call but uh, it's a close call not not an accident and that that's that's the fine line that is between uh, knocking a rider off and being thrown out of the race and maybe making a mistake which could be the end of your driving career and um and living to fight another day and my, my pet theory is that many of these motorcycle accidents have been caused by riders on the bigger bikes some of them 
uh, the bikes that are supplied by the race organisers. And these are the big 1,000cc, 1,400cc touring bikes. They're so fast, these bikes. It's so easy to open the throttle and suddenly you're doing 50 mile per hour. And there's often um, the drivers on them are not necessarily the drivers that are mixing with the peloton day to day like the uh, motorcycle drivers who carry photographers are you know, you'll see us we're on the older more sort of knackered looking bikes so what do you drive i've got a 650 suzuki and it's the smallest bike that anyone uses actually and I've got one of the heaviest riders but it means that we can't go too far <laughs> Graham will love you saying that but I get what you mean so really you're kind of closer to the peloton in terms of what you can do you can't suddenly turn the gas on and, and do something unpredictably yourself so you almost become part of the, the living thing that is the peloton I think I think that's, that's fair to say I think we're a little bit more in tune with, with the, the rhythm of the, of the peloton whereas some of the other drivers who are here to carry officials or medics or whatever they're not necessarily working inside the bunch all day like we are you know they're required to pass the peloton at certain times and it's coming really nervous for them because they're just not as sort of you know we're in there all day and we sort of sort of get used to it and we saw the incident at la drome last week with a very tight hairpin bend the motorcycle was too close probably to the front of the bunch but then there's all those pressures to get the best tv images that you can well i've seen that and I, i'd urge anyone listening to watch the 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 video of that and i don't believe that that was the motorcyclist's fault I think it was, a, if you like, a racing incident where the motorcycle went slightly wide, had to pull in. The first half dozen riders saw him and went round him. There was a little bit of a slowdown and then the rider, about 12 riders back, clipped the wall. By that point, the right motorcycle had pulled away, well away from any, anything close to the incident involving the rider himself. I'm not saying that the very first moment the rider actually pulled in at the side wasn't the start of that accident, but it was not the same thing as knocking a rider over and we this is a professional sport you know without tv without crowds lining the roads making it tighter and more exciting looking there would not be a professional sport t t you have to have tv there's drivers are the motorbike drivers are fantastic tv drivers now and again the riders will catch them up on a corner you know there may be an incident and this is i believe ha- has has happened all the way through bike racing history do you sometimes have that sort of heart-stopping moment thinking that was close i try not to and i would say in the main i don't you have to concentrate so hard on what you're doing in the job that you don't really have time if you're thinking about other stuff then uh, then you're not doing it properly so um i'd say that in the main, no, I, tr- I, I, I don't think I don't think about the helicopter hovering above me or the regulator looking. We just have to, you know, we're doing our absolute utmost to ride safely, get the job done. We don't we don't worry about it. So we heard there from Jim Okovitz, the man in charge at BMC Racing, and and Luke Evans, who has been a pilot for Graham Watson, the photographer, since 1990, on and off. So he's seen a lot, been around the block a bit, and. You know, he was talking before the death of uh, De Moitier, but as you say, Lionel, it's been an issue that's been brewing a while. It's, there have been more and more incidents of collisions or, or near misses, and, uh, you know, th- there has been a, a fear that motorbikes and vehicles on the race have been putting riders in danger. But to get Luke's perspective was very, very interesting, and, and particular, in particular what he was saying about the, the sort of bike he uses, the that it's, you know not a very powerful machine and that they can be more in tune with the rhythm of of the peloton i thought that was a really interesting point yeah and they obviously are in the peloton all day every day as you know during the tour de france and the, they know the the way that the race unfolds and and as luke says they have a a routine that they observe but the interesting point that, that stuck out to me was when he's talking about near misses and and you know he make, makes the point that they might try to overtake the bunch or and get shouted at a couple of times and then have to go back and that just highlights to me that these decisions are being made in split seconds as circumstances change all around them because the race is a living thing the the riders might come out from a line of trees and suddenly the wind's off the right hand side and they all move over to the other side of the road and suddenly the situation looks very different so they're making decisions in split seconds 
but it's also interesting to hear from Luke that they're not making these decisions necessarily straight off their own initiative. They're being given instructions by the regulator who is giving them permission to go past when it's deemed safe. And they can only make those decisions. They can't see the future. They can't, you know, second guess. The difficulty, I suppose, is away from the front of the race where it all breaks up and there's so many vehicles. You could argue, does every team need two team cars, for example? I mean, you know, all of these debates will no doubt be um, had by the UCI and the various interested parties. But we've all stood by the side of the road and see a, seen a race come past. The bunch takes, you know, however many seconds to go past and then it's minutes while the entire entourage of vehicles goes by and the riders are very often in amongst that um, cavalcade of vehicles. I mean, it's it's yeah. Th- these motorcycle pilots require nerves of steel and, and a great deal of skill. And I mentioned earlier being on a motorbike in the the Tour de France, and y- you sort of queue up. You're like planes sort of uh, stacking over Heathrow or something, waiting to be given the signal to move through the bunch. And you know, there was one year, um, maybe 2007, 2008, when I was on a motorbike, and we were waiting. In fact, it was 2008 because it was the day that Ricardo Rico was thrown off the race. We were waiting behind the bunch to, to be allowed to go past. And eventually, we were on a wide enough road where the bunch moved over to the left side of the road. We were given the signal to go through. And, you know, Luke mentions about speed. And I think the I was on quite a powerful motorbike. You know, there, there's an argument that sometimes it might be safer to go quicker because... You know the the bunch can then can move and and you know the, the the sooner you can get past them the better and and so we were going up the right hand side not too quick but the the bunch there was a, a not a crash but you know a near miss and the the bunch just sort of swung over to the right side of the road we were surrounded by riders which was really quite terrifying and they were swearing in every language you could imagine and some that you couldn't um, I remember it was a very near miss with people Posato actually who was. Uh, gesticulating wildly but you know it was it was pretty scary and I was a, a passenger on the bike and I was I was scared so the the motorcycle pilot in that, in that instance like that really needs an awful lot of skill and 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 good judgment um we have probably been better going past quicker you know in in that, in that particular moment and so I think um you know Brian Cookson in his post is talking about increasing regulation Luke mentioned that there there is there are more stringent sort of rules and regulations around who can ride and who can't in a race but um, yeah, that needs to be tightened up but there are some things that you just will never be able to legislate for yeah and, and there are going to be changes we expect changes and people are going to be unhappy because it might be for example that some of the press motorbikes are taken out it might be that there are fewer commissaires it might be this it probably won't come to this but it might be that certain parts of a course are designated for the peloton having to stick to one side of the road for example there might be designated passing places um but whereas previously it's been done kind of on the hoof but there will always be one aggrieved party and you know even on social media over the weekend the very experienced photographers people like well it wasn't Graham but um, people who follow professional bike racing as photographers week in week out was, were defending themselves really and saying that no they weren't the problem and there weren't too many motorbikes in the race and then there were even you know um, there was an Italian rider you know, Cesare Benedetti who was not, not blaming but he was pointing out to his peers, fellow riders, that you know they're fighting for wheels, fighting for position in the first 100 kilometres of races. And really, that's not helpful for safety either. And again, there's this huge divergence of opinion. And one of the big problems with professional cycling is that it is a moving, it's a travelling circus. And there is no there is no window in the calendar for everyone to stop and sit down and take stock and get together in a big conference room or a convention centre. And and really discuss things because, you know, as, as I said on Twitter, no one has all the answers and it really has to be a, a brainstorming session and there has to be a compromise and there has to be an acknowledgement as well that all of the problems are not going to be solved and all we can do is get closer to a situation where everyone's going to be safe. You mentioned earlier, Daniel, that there will be the legacy of Demarte's awful death will be that there will be there will be changes. Changes will will will, will happen inevitably. And if we look back over the years when there have been other 
moments like this. We all remember Walter Wayland in, in 2011 at the Giro d'Italia, Fabio Casartelli in 95, Andrei Kivalev in 2003. I mean, it's amazing that helmets didn't become compulsory after the death of Casartelli, but it took Kivalev's death, actually, to, to bring that about. Now, there will be a legacy... Rich, and, and hopefully it will be improvements for the sport. But you know, just going back to Dimwati's death itself, I um, you know, we're all upset and and, and devastated, really. But you know, it, it goes without saying, and this is stating the obvious that our reaction to it really will pale, obviously, in comparison with the grief of the family. And you know, when these things happen, Casatelli's death, for example, it's become this sort of tragic footnote in cycling history that we all mention whenever the 1995 Tour de France comes up we all mention it the Olympic road race because Casatelli was the Olympic champion but you know what really brought it home to me you know how absolutely horrific it is to have a family member suffer a fate like this was you know going to meet Casatelli's family um, at their home on the 10th anniversary actually of his death and and, you know, you really realise there that for them it's obviously not just a footnote and it's not something that 10 years later they have they have, have recovered from. And, you know, even now 20 years later they, I'm sure, have not recovered. And their, their lives were still really completely torn apart by what had happened. And, you know, you hear the story from Casatelli's mum of she, she was ironing at the time watching the stage on TV and a Motorola rider went down and the commentator thought that it was a, a different rider. It was the Colombian rider Alvaro Mejia. And, she, yeah, she had no idea that it was her son that had just gone down. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, they corrected themselves and the penny started to drop. And, again, you know, her life and, and that family's life is really frozen in time and, and it is absolutely awful. Um, and, and on, you know, just going back to the practicalities, I think one party we haven't heard that much from in the last few days has been race organisers and there's a bit of confusion about where exactly responsibility lies for which motorbikes in the are in a race and, and what those motorbikes do and how the traffic is controlled. Um, so to address that, we thought it'd be a good idea to talk to Mick Bennett, didn't we, the Tour of Britain organiser, a, a race that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, or when it sort of relaunched, did have its problems with traffic and well-publicised problems and has really done a fantastic job, it seems, of resolving those problems. So here is Mick Bennett talking about safety on his race, the Tour of Britain. It's dreadful, dreadful news and it's the news that the whole of the, the cycling fraternity doesn't want to hear, read and see and... Um, my heart goes out to his family, close friends, but also his teammates who were with him on the day and those that were around him in, in the same incident. It's a shocking state of affairs and um, it, would, it would be completely wrong to apportion blame to anybody at this stage. And that includes the UCI, the moto pilots, um, the, the, the road layout, whatever the situation was when um, this young man was killed, but to die in pursuit of something that you love doing is just so emotional and tragic. It's, it's unbelievable. And from the point of view of a race organiser, obviously organisers are going to come under pressure and scrutiny and the UCI in particular has come under a lot of scrutiny, particularly about the role of motorbikes in races. And there has been a perception, particularly after accidents like the one at the weekend and, and other incidents earlier this year, that motorbikes are strewn now through a bike race willy-nilly there are too many of them um but i think you would perhaps like to point out that a lot of the motorbikes are there to guarantee rider safety yeah it's, that's the irony of it that um we have on the women's tour and the, and the men's tour of britain we have something like 70 working motorcycles either in and around the peloton or ahead uh, or in fact um paramedics on motors because in this country uh, we operate a rolling road closure we don't operate a, a total closure which um, the, the, the Grand Tours do and a lot of the other major single day events in, in Northern Europe do also I must say we also have a total closure for the Ride London Classic as well which you would say would make it slightly safer but my issue, my issue is with the size of the peloton you know, we, you've got to, I think, something like the three days of Depana has 25. They've reduced their 
signalers, as they call them, we call them the National Escort Group, uh, down to about seven or eight signalers that they have, a total of 25 motorcycles on the event, uh, and they've greatly reduced that this year. But you can't have 200 riders in a peloton and have working motorcyclists travelling, sometimes having to travel at high speeds, moving through an ever-changing... It's like a, it's like an embryo. It's growing, it's shrinking, it's dying, it's developing all the time. Those guys on the motorbikes have got one hell of a job to do. And yet my heart goes out to the pilot, the, the Dutch guy that was involved with it. Because, and, and the other incidents that, that have occurred, these guys wouldn't deliberately drive at a professional bike or any bike rider for this. They are former bike riders themselves. They understand what they're doing. And it's just a dreadful situation to be in. But we are, um, together with British Cycling, putting everything under the microscope once again. And we've been doing it for three or four months now, looking and re-examining what we do. And we probably have, with, as I've said, 70... Well, we do have 70 motorbikes involved with the event. And probably one of the biggest in the whole of Europe because we have operate a rolling road closure. It's not a total closure. Does the, does the UCI do enough, Mick, and has the UCI done enough to ensure that bike racing, which is inherently dangerous, is as safe as it can be? I don't think the UCI can do enough. Um, should they do more? Of course they should do. Should other organisers do more? Of course we should all do more. But I think we have to look at the size of the peloton. As I've said, 200 riders on six metres of road in a crosswind is it's it's an accident waiting to happen and the fact that we've got away for it for so long touchwood the races in the uk we've never had a serious sorry the rate my events we've never had a serious situation uh, occur i know we've had um uh, escort motorcyclists hit riders in other events but uh british cycling together with us uh, together with our central escort group which is the police element together with the national escort Group, which is this licensed civilian group, are now going to re-examine our whole procedure. Uh, and if it means me meeting with all the riders before the start of the event to spell it out to them that on this country, the law of the land dictates that you race on the left-hand side of the road. You feed on the left. Um, many of the European teams that come over have that to manage as well, and it doesn't fall naturally to them. So we've got to be conscious that the peloton and the riders and the DSs have an issue with that on its own. But we need to re-examine everything. Um, it may be that sections of the Tour of Britain have to be totally closed. We've had it in the past, um, generally as we run in towards the finish. Um, but can the UCI do more? Of course they can. Can the riders group, the, the CAP do more? Can the DSs do more? Everybody needs to do more, not can we. We need to do more. I mean... <clears throat> One of the issues that, that we heard earlier in our podcast about from uh, a motorcycle pilot was the the size of motorbikes, um, size of the engines, but the weight of the motorbikes is it was perhaps an, a factor in, in the death of De Moitier. Um We were talking b- before we turned the recorder on as well about ideas. Daniel had the the suggestion that the motorcycles that pass a peloton have a a special horn you know with a particular sound um can you say something to that and and to the issue of the size of the motorbikes as well i think it's a great idea um uh to have a a distinct a more distinct sound of the civilian uh motorbikes is a is a brilliant idea but then the riders have to understand that once they hear that sound They need to be conscious that in and around them is a motorcycle uh, carrying out an essential role. And the irony is he's trying to get ahead to shut a junction down to stop traffic moving in towards him. So they need to be conscious of this as well. There's no point in having that sound if they're still going to ignore him. And I've seen riders time after time after time ignore up to four motorbikes all queuing up to get by. And I, you know, I'm a former pro myself. I understand that you don't want to move off that wheel because if you do, potentially, and some ins- the, the, the race is over. As with the size of motorbikes, we tend to draw on the National Escort Group in this country. 
tend to draw on uh, either former uh, bike riders that have their own motorcycle that want to move into escorting, they want to be part of this wonderful world of cycling in, in the UK. And it tends to be, if they qualify, I don't know whether the motorcycle is taken into consideration whether that, that qualifies them or not. I would hazard a guess that it doesn't. Um, but it's clear that we don't want massively comfortable bikes. But then, on the other hand, we don't want undersized, underpowered um, motocross bikes, which I've, I've seen as well. It's interesting that uh, I think it was Piaggio sponsors the Giro and they use high-powered motor scooters, which are a lot lighter. Now, whether that's something to look at, uh, it's difficult, but I, to, to sort of say you can only work on this event if you've got a certain size motorbike, certain weight, we'd probably lose two-thirds, if not three-quarters of our whole national escort group. And just a final thing I'd put to you, Mick, as well, is that all of this and guaranteeing the safety of the riders comes at great expense to you, the organiser, doesn't it? I mean, we just spoke before we started recording about the efforts um, you've gone to before about um, preventing people from taking selfies, etc., etc. Big campaigns um, before the race to do with that. And it does cost a lot of money, doesn't it? It costs hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And it's our biggest, it's our biggest element from everything from barriers, police escort hotels, um, what we call yellow and blacks, which is the advanced warning signs we put out on the whole route. We print hundreds of thousands of leaflets. We, we have a team going out doing all of this. Um, we sometimes take roundabouts out, splitters out. Um, we have uh, advanced technical teams putting all this signage out, all this safety signage out, and it costs hundreds of thousands, but that to me is it's an essential part of the job. And if we have to reduce the prize money to do that, then we have to do that. We don't. But if that's, you know, we're in a difficult sponsorship um, period at the moment. We're trying to find a headline sponsor for the Men's Tour of Britain. But they're all things that cost an awful lot of money. And the safety, you cannot compromise on it. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for their sponsorship. Coming up on the home of cycling this weekend, Sunday, is the second monument of the season, the Tour of Flanders. We'll be talking about that in a minute. Uh, and next week, the Tour of the Basque Country. I will actually be there. I'm going to the Tour of the Basque Country and I'll be bringing back some some stuff from there. And also midweek, Skelda Priest, the, the sort of a sprinter's classic that falls in between Tour of Flanders and Pyro Bay. That's all coming up on Eurosport. Yeah, um, we've done another big race explainer for the Tour of Flanders, which is available to listen to now in all of the usual places. It's in our iTunes feed and all the rest of it. Yeah, it's just a short little episode capturing a bit of the flavour of the Tour of Flanders. Features last year's winner, Alexander Christoph and three-time winner, Tom Bonin. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Trainer Road. Cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk-free for 30 days. We'll preview the tour of fans in a moment, but you heard there for the last time our extended Trainer Road jingle. We look a bit sad, Lionel. Very sad. I mean, with five months we've been sponsored by Trainer Road, we're enormously grateful to them, but we've also got a lot more out of it than just sponsorship I think we, we had our big showdown this week and um, that will be in a featuring in a special mini episode next week that we we all went up to Manchester myself Lionel Burney and Rob Hatch and raced over four kilometers we're not going to there's a there's an embargo on the results so that'll come out in the special podcast next the week the inquiry still going on isn't it the it's like it's with at the moment it's with Cass so we'll, 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 once we get the ruling from them it's been rushed through have uh, the samples been frozen the samples will be frozen for 12 years, I believe. But yeah, it's been it's been a really a really great experience. I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed doing it. I feel much better for it. I'm five kilograms lighter. I'm fitter, um, and I'm going to carry on. Yeah, I think I will. I mean, it's um, the, the benefits of it. I think are obvious. Um, I would never have thought I could do a whole winter of turbo training. 
uh, I would normally not have touched my bike probably between about November and February. So it's done me the power of good. So if anybody wants some structured training, do try Trainer Road and tell them that you heard about them through the cycling podcast, please, gonna, that will help us an, enormously. We're going to have a new sponsor, aren't we, Rich? We've got a new from sponsor next from next week. I'm very grateful to sigmasport.co.uk, uh, who are coming in to sponsor us for April. So um, we'll be telling you the a bit more about that next week. The home of road cycling. That's correct, Daniel. Not, the home of, not to be confused with the home of cycling. So we, from next week, we'll be sponsored by the home of cycling and the home of road cycling. Uh, sigmasport.co.uk. Home of cycling is your sport, Daniel, as well as your abode. With Rob Hatch, the aforementioned Rob Hatch. Anyway, um, yeah, sigmasport.co.uk from next week. Thank you very much to them. So, Tour of Flanders this weekend, your favourite race of the year, I think, Lionel? I think it probably is, actually, yeah. It's a, it's a real... Um, race? It's a, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an event, isn't it? I think, well, if you've anyone has listened to our latest Friends of the Podcast special, Flanders Fever, which I very much enjoyed making with our producer, Paul Scoyne. And I recommend very much because uh, I wasn't, we weren't involved in it really, were we, Dan? We were a little bit in it, but it's it's an excellent... It's an excellent bit of work. Well done, it's a, it's a lot of different voices trying to convey what the Tour of Flanders means. And I think Harry Pearson, who wrote a book about Belgian life and culture, um, put it best when he said the Tour of Flanders is like the FA Cup final or the Grand National or the boat race. Wimbledon. Wimbledon. Eurovision Song Contest all kind of rolled into one. <laughs> it is. Uh, who's going to win it? I mean, or who's going to... We, we were writing off uh, Alexander Christoph, I think, on the basis of... Gent Wevelgen, but we're speaking as the three days of the pan is, is underway and he's won the first stage, looked in, in very good form there. So perhaps it was premature to write him off, but Peter Sagan has finally got the win at Gent Wevelgen. Of course, it was sadly overshadowed by Antoine de Moitier's death, but um, a very a very good win by um, by P- P- Peter Sagan there. Um, we I got in a little sort of I wouldn't call it a spat or an argument. It was a, a minor discussion on Twitter with um, John Bradley from Velo News and, and Phil Guyman from uh, uh, Cannondale. Two very incendiary characters. Very, very, very <laughs> incendiary. No, um, but they were, they were, they were sort of. Uh, uh, didn't seem very happy that, that there was always focus on Sagan's apparent failure to win. I don't think by highlighting his. Uh, run of second place as you are we are mocking him I, on the contrary I mean I think that uh, you know his his consistency is, is phenomenal but even more and as I thought about this a bit more I, I was even more impressed by the fact that despite not winning he doesn't change the way he races at all he carries on with that aggressive we were talking to Shane Sutton yesterday when we were up in Manchester weren't we Lionel and he was talking about this as well but just how remarkable an athlete he is given his build, given how much he has to fight to, to uh, you know, to get over the, some of these claims. I have a theory about Peter Sagan, that whenever a race, the name of a race, is one place to another place, he thinks it's a stage race, and he's riding for GC constantly. And it's only at the World Championships when he realises that the winner is the guy who crosses the line first. <laughs> That's your <laughs> theory about my, Peter Sagan. M- my theory kind of falls down with Gent Wevelgum, doesn't it? It does a little bit. What about the Tour of Flanders? Yeah. Um, anyway, the story... And Tour of Flanders is all about ethics, quick step, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's all about whether they are going to finally get it right tactically. And it's really been intriguing to watch their gaffes over the past few weeks, starting with Het Newsblad. Gaff then, prone ethics, quick step. Yeah. And then um, E3, Harold Becker, where. You know, the, the pole, uh, one by the pole. One by the pole, <laughs> the, the phonetic bet noir. Um, Michael. Michal. Kwiatkowski. Um it's probably my best yet. Anyway, um Lionel mentioned earlier Cancellara's remarkable pursuit to get back to the lead group in E3 Harold Becker. And it was it was intriguing to watch just how they behaved and how they played their cards, their ethics quick step. They had four guys in the main group and it, you know it, it Everyone talks about their power in numbers, and in that particular situation, they seemed like they had a numerical advantage. They had four riders. The most any other team had was two. But then what they proceeded to do was completely burn two riders, sacrifice two riders, and they were left with two against two Trek riders, two BMC riders. So they'd completely eaten up and eroded their own numerical advantage. 
It's kind of like having 60% possession in a football match and by keeping the ball and doing the obvious thing, they think that that is the safest tactic. And I really think it comes down to the fact they're not willing but, to they're not willing to lose races. But also, also not having a striker. Not I mean, having a I finisher. Mean, you can have all the possession that you like if you don't have a striker. Yeah. And I also think with, with uh, Etik's quick step, in a couple of races it's looked to me as though Matteo Trentin might be the strongest guy but is an Italian rider going to get the sort of support that a Bonin or even an even a Nicky Terps? Was well, and, get? and there's been a lot of scrutiny of Wilfred Peters, the director sportif at Etics Quickstep, and he really is well, he's very close to Tom Boonen, and Tom Boonen is Peters' protege, and there is a feeling that Peters will be the lead director for the Belgian races as long as Boonen is there. But as soon as Boonen perhaps retires, then Peters might be eased aside. You know, they have a very close relationship, but. It seems to me they are terrified of losing um, and you need to be prepared to lose in order to win. And you looked at that group in Harold Becker and the the composition of that group, there was Trek who have already won a classic this year. There was um, BMC who have already won with Van Avermaet, won Het Newsblad. And um, you know there was Sky who have already won big races this year. And all those teams... You, you know, they'd relieved the pressure on themselves to a certain extent by winning and also by being prepared to lose. But with ethics, it's like, it, it's the be all and end all. Every race seems like it, it's their riding is like it's the last race they're ever going to ride. Sagan's like a one man band, but that he encapsulates that, he embodies that willingness to lose. I mean, there he was on Friday in E3, you know, he got to the, the line with. Kwiatkowski absolutely spent and wasn't able to sprint. Didn't stop him two days later committing fully to another break. Yeah, you mentioned about um, Etix Quick Step. I mean, if we think back a few years, it's quite a few years now, but they always used to have a plan on for the Tour of Flanders, and, and often it wasn't plan A that came off. Um, but I wonder whether it's the gradual kind of decline of Tom Bonin a little bit, which is not necessarily enabling them to to play the same card that they did before I can think of years when say Sylvain Chavanel would go up the road with say 100 or 80 kilometres to go and then when that all comes back together then they'd send Stein de Volder up who isn't their main man but he pulled off two victories in a very similar way because everybody else is sitting behind worried about Tom Bonin and they haven't quite got they've got a, as you say they've got a lot of kind of holding midfielders and, and no no finishers yeah and the the composition of well they're sort of they've always really had a trident they've had a finisher which has been Boone and they've had this uh, sort of um, lone wolf that was Chavanel who would go off sort of 50k from the finish and and enable them not to have to work on the front of the of the lead group. And then they, they had another kind of counter-puncher, which has been Terpstra, who's the guy who can go um, with 10k to go or 5k to go or 2k to go. And it seems to me they don't really quite know how to use Tony Martin yet. I think they're, all, they're pleasantly surprised by how good Tony Martin has been in the classics so far, but they're kind of using him as a workhorse when it looks to me as though he should perhaps be the Chavanel, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if he was the guy to go whether it's 60k from the finish or 40k from the finish or 30k That's from the finish. A lot more markable than, yeah. than, a, than, a, um, than a Chavanel though, Tony Martin. Who's going to mm. let Tony Martin go anywhere in, in even well, that but far? But if they do, then you know, it really puts a lot mm. of pressure on the other teams which might play eventually into Etics Quick Step's hands. <laughs> there, there, we should wrap up, so we should finish with uh, uh, a prediction for the Tour of Finals. Probably Etics Quick Step are going to win having had this discussion, but um, no, who, who, who's going to win the Tour of Finals? It's obvious. It's obvious. Filippo Pozzato. He's absolutely <laughs> purring. <laughs> yeah, but is he going to win the Tour of Flanders? He's always purring. Five pounds of my money says he is. Well, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Turn up for no, the I, th um, I think he, he actually does have a chance as an outsider. Um, I think probably Etics will pull something out of the weekend. Who Although I can't really see who it's going to come Trentin. from. I, I think maybe Stebar is the... M Trentin Stebar. or Stebar... It's the most obvious, looks the most on form. And then Christoph, we were sort of writing him off when he got ill at the weekend, and then he comes back in Depana, looks incredibly strong. So he's also got a great chance. Okay, uh, dark horse Luke Rowe has looked pretty good. He was in that break in the three days of Depan. The uh, guy that we featured earlier in the year, Teish Benot, has looked incredibly good and he was fifth last year. He can't sprint, so I don't know how he's going to win it, but I think he'll be up there. Um, 
emotionally, I'd love to see Tom Bonin do it one more time, but I just, I just can't see it. Cancellar, we've not mentioned. Cancellar is my favourite. I, I think Cancellar. I think the course is is it's so it's it's hard, isn't it? Now with that circuit of the twice up the Pattersburg, three times over the Old Aquinamont, you know those those circuits, uh, you know, do make it uh, less kind of tactically uh, nuanced, perhaps, than the old course. Um, Alexander Christoph was talking about how you know the the the, the Tom Bonin specialist move with that sort of thirty odd k to go. Um, yeah, you know, everybody is aware of that. Everybody knows that that the moment to go, and that actually, you know, him and uh, Christoph and, and Terpstra sort of pulled a bit of a fast one last year, and and we hadn't seen the race decided in quite that way since they've switched to this circuit course. And just on Sky, Rich, what a revelation the the vanity signing was in Eastwood. Uh, oh, yes. It, it, absolutely extraordinary performance. Really um, putting into question everything he's done so far, or every race that he's been sent to in his career so far, because he just looked like average to the man born, didn't average he? 283 watts the whole race, which uh, I, I'd just done in my latest FTP test on Trainer Road, <laughs> and it's pretty disturbing. But, but he really could. looked as though that's where he should have spent his entire career up to this point on the cobbles because or on the um, you know, in the cobble class maybe an outsider look. then for Flanders well and, and you know they're going to have to Garrett be quite Thomas smart and cute well. in the way that they play their cards as well because they've got Thomas coming back they, they, assuming he's got over his, his little illness yeah and they've they got were, Stannard they were, and Rowe Kwiatkowski and Sagan go back a long way they they bumped shoulders a couple of times on the run into the line were words exchanged then was there any kind of discussion any kind of conversation had between Sagan and Kwiatkowski do we think you sound like you're trying to bait me into something. <laughs> I am trying to bait you into something, <laughs> exactly. Just on the van. Because Sagan didn't contest the sprint. Was he really tired or did he not contest the sprint a la Rigoberta Uran in London has a lot to thank Sagan for and it's not just that victory at E3 because I think Kwiatkowski, whatever paycheck he's getting from Sky, I think Sagan's name was fairly prominent in negotiations between... Um, Kwiatkowski's agent the pastry chef who we've, we've talked about before won't go into now and Team Sky because I think in those negotiations Sagan was seen as the benchmark he's earning this therefore my guy needs to earn this and consequently got a very handsome annual salary we should wrap it up there we chaps. should yeah uh, we've gone on long enough uh, so that's all for this week I- I'm off to tour the Basque country next week so I'll, I'll send in something from there you chaps will be convening I'm sure and discussing two of fans looking forward to Pyro Bay that's all for this week thank you very much Daniel thank you thank you Lionel thank you you've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast thank you to Glass Pear for the music in this episode for more information and to download more editions of the show visit thecyclingpodcast.com